to press got it. Okay, so, so welcome everybody to Imaging One World. This is, um, I think, the first talk after the long summer break. So um, I hope you had a good summer break and now you're kind of going back um, into the labs full of energy and wonderful new microscopy ideas. And well, what is kind of the best time in the year to spend hours in a dark room with only tiny little blinking lights than autumn and winter. So I'm Stephanie, there is also Alessandro, Alex, Nick and um, Kirti is on holiday today. Um, we are the Imaging One World organizers and I think most people who probably join by now know about us but obviously the other person to mention is Jess or Georgina which often joins not today from the Royal Microscopic Society who have been absolutely amazing supporting Imaging One World administratively and sending out reminders and not just administratively I think also um, kind of overall like wonderful unfortunately not biscuit, biscuits and tea but like in general kind of support for everything we do so today we have um our first we realize um well commercial faculty but it's not going to be a commercial talk by graham hungerford from who works for oriba he's a principal scientist there he has worked as um, on the dev development and the application of time resolved fluorescent systems and time resolved fluorescent imaging as a lecturer as well. He has been recently a senior research scientist at the University of Strathclyde and was for several years assistant professor in Portugal. He's going to speak about a lot of different usages of um, particular cameras who are predominantly used for time resolved fluorescence imaging but have now very wide usages in light sheet and single molecule imaging and please Graham welcome to Imaging One World and share your talk and your slides and um, tell us all about what we should be doing in the next few dark months mm -hmm. when we're sitting on our microscopes. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Stephanie. You're most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> right, hopefully you can see the screen now. Yeah, perfect. What I, thank you very much. What I'd like to do is just go and give a bit of a background to some fluorescence lifetime imaging techniques and also how some advances in basically semiconductor technology have enabled us to make use of looking at the fluorescence lifetime in real time. And I'll give a couple of examples of this as well. So when we're looking at our sample and we want to look at the fluorescence part of it, normal techniques we can use are things such as wide field microscopy, we can use scanning focal microscopy if we want to do sin sectioning. We also have the ability for total internal reflectance. This means we can look at the evanescent wave or make use of it to look at fits of the sample very close by. Or we can use light sheet microscopy, which produces a thin sheet of light through the sample, which you can then move up and down to actually get some volume imaging. Normally, you can consider commonly the areas of wide field turf and light sheet as being those where you normally put onto an intensity imaging camera. If we think a bit more about wide field, really what we're having here is an illumination of all of the sample, which we can then image. And this means we can get to the image very quickly, but we do have the minor problems of out of focus fluorescence on the sun. If we're looking at confocality or confocal based systems, here we can put light in, and this is normally a scanning over the sample. These are using a Galvo scanner here, which moves the laser beam over. You can actually use movement of the stage as well. And the major part to give you the confocality is a spatial filter or pinhole before the detector. So this gives you a lot better optical sectioning 
but is obviously a bit slower technique than to use a wide field approach. Another place where we can get higher resolution is to make use of two photon excitation. So if you will need to excite a sample at 400 nanometers, you can choose instead two photons of 800 nanometers, which will combine if you get them in the same place at the same time to get the same energy as the 400 nanometer photon of light. So here, yet again, we can scan over the sample. And the difference here really between this and the confocal system is that there is no pinhole here on the emission side. What we're doing instead is making use of the two photon process, which only will excite a femtoliter volume of the sample to get our resolution out. It has its advantages as well, because you just look at a small vo volume, which means you can actually remove a lot of the out of focus photo bleaching of the sample. But you too tend to have to use very high femtosecond laser sources in order to get the required photon flux of the system. So if we look really back at fluorescence itself, we have to remember that this is a molecular process. So we have absorption of light, which occurs on the femtosecond time scale, to, from the singlet state, from the ground to the excited. And a bit of time later, we get the fluorescence coming out, normally typically nanoseconds picoseconds now second time scale. And looking at this in the steady state, we get our typical absorption and fluorescence spectrum. So this is in terms of intensity versus wavelengths, or in other words, energy. There's also the possibility of the movement into the excited triplet state, which gives rise to phosphorescence phenomena. These occur on the microseconds to seconds time scale. And normally we don't consider this. But this steady state approach is only half of the story. What we can also do is measure how long these molecules will spend in the excited state. For this, we can imagine exciting an ensemble of molecules and then watching them decay back down to the ground state. What we can do is then get an average time for how long they spend in this excited state. And we can call this a fluorescence lifetime, or to be more exact, what we wait is for it to fall to one over E of its initial value. If we're having one excited state, then what we'd expect theoretically is there to be one single exponential decay. If we're having more than one excited state, we then expect maybe in the case of two to have the sum of two exponential excited states. So fluorescence is really a multi-parameter signal, dependent on the intensity, both the excitation and emission wavelengths, polarization, the time, here the lifetime, and also position, which is important when we're looking at microscopy. So if we take our fluorescence signal and we take our image, our normal intensity image here will show up different features. But if we look at the lifetime, we are adding this extra dimension, we can see that we are actually the ability to add extra contrast to our image. The thing that is important to note about the lifetime is it's that it's concentration independent. So that means if you've been loading up your sample with different dyes, we're not looking at local differences in concentration. The lifetime can be totally can be independent of that. So it gives us a bit of a better ability to see interactions between different molecules, for example. And also it means you're not so prone to seeing photo bleaching effect. One of my great ones to say is if we consider say five molecules, so we have five units of fluorescence and say each of these molecules has a lifetime of 10 nanoseconds. If we remove three of them, the intensity has dropped to two units but the lifetime is still in nanoseconds. So it's a very good means to provide extra image contrast and to look at different interactions. One time someone said to me, well, basically what you're looking at these two images is, oh, you're changing a black and white image into a color image. This is obviously not the case. What we're doing is we're choosing our own intensity scale here as a gray scale. But what we are really doing is adding that extra dimension to help us get more information out. 
because with this multi-parameter signal, what one of our intentions is, is to gain as much knowledge about all these parameters as possible. So how can we measure the fluorescence lifetime? Well, one of the more uh, sensitive techniques for doing this is that of time-correlated single photon counting. This involves using a pulse light source, typically a laser, a detector for single photon counting, and also a time digital tizer, or which can be a TAC, a time to digital converter, but basically can be thought of as a glorified stopwatch. So when we put in our pulse of light into the sample to excite it, we will start our timing device. When the sample a certain time later releases its photon and we detect it, <clears throat> that can provide our stop signal to our timing device. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we can then do is put these different times into our histogram. And what we're expecting if we have a single excited state is that of an exponential decay. And this will slowly build up once we have enough data. On the right, you can see we have a, a logarithmic scale on our intensity and our single exponential comes up very nicely as being a straight line. So we can see it fairly clearly. It's one of the advantages of the TCSPC technique. It's quite intuitive to see, looking at the data, what is occurring. So if we take our normal scanning microscope setup, how can we actually add in TCSP, the lifetime capability? Well, one, we need a pulse laser, so to give us our excitation source. Our detector can be a single photon detector, or in this case, the state of the art would be a hybrid detector. We need our timing electronics, with our start signal coming from the laser and our stop signal coming from the detector. Since we're scanning over the sample and we want to build up a picture, we need some form of synchronization to tell the software where things are occurring. And just to give you an example of what the equipment, some of these TCSPC components look like, we have them here on the bottom right. You'll notice even on this picture, in the far bottom right, there's a pound coin. That doesn't signify that that's the cost of the equipment, unfortunately, but it's just to give you an idea of the scale of it. So here we just have a detector, the laser with the electronics and the timing electronics. So the data which we can get out of TCSPC is normally considered in the form of histograms. And here we have a intensity image of some pollen grains, which is the sum histogram of all the individual decays. And what we can do is we can do fitting to this. In this case, we don't have one single excited state, we have a sum of two, so we're looking for two lifetimes. And the image at the bottom left shows the average lifetime, with red being more and blue being less. So in other words, the grain on the far right has a shorter lift lifetime on average than that on the other decays. We can also do a goodness of fit, which can sometimes also give us contrast. In addition, if we look at our equation there, we have a pre-exponential function. And we can use this to show the prevalence of each of the lifetime data. Because we're looking for a short-lived decay, say on the, on the one on the far left, we notice that we have more prevalence of the 0.7 nanosecond decay in that particular grain, and practically no prevalence of the three nanoseconds. So we can look at the data in this respect by looking at the images, both in terms of average lifetime and also the prevalence of the pre-exponential function in each of the cases for the lifetimes. Another way in which data can be represented is that in terms of a phasor plot. Here we have a universal circle, and if it's a single exponential, we'd expect the lifetime or the plot to appear on the circle. If a for multi-exponential lifetimes, we find these appearing within the circle. And how can this be used? Well, here we have our, just a very blanket intensity and lifetime image. If we plot the phasor diagram, 
If we select part of the phasor diagram, this will then select different lifetime regions. So we can use this as a model-free approach to actually select different parts of the image. The phasor plot normally requires a calibration to be done prior to its usage. So although we're not actually doing any fitting, we do need a calibration approach to occur. So where can we actually make use of FLIM? Well, wherever we have to want to make use of the fluorescence lifetime, and we can actually see this spatially on the sample. FLIM is quite often used in the bio life sciences to look at sort of protein interactions, changes in environment, and environments can be in cases of change of pH, temperature, stress or pressure, and even molecular conformation, making use of processes such as fluorescence resonance energy transfer. But there are a few limitations when it comes to looking at fast evolving dynamic processes. This is because typically we'll be using a scanning approach to look at the data. So if we wanted to look at the data faster and to make use of FLIM to look at a more dynamic processes, what we really want is obviously the fast data collection. And this would imply looking at a parallel approach to collecting the data. We also need to process the data quite fast to get out the fluorescence lifetime. So using an on the fly approach, this tends to lend itself more for an average lifetime approach rather than produce, doing a lot of number crunching to get out the multi-exponential data. Although with the improvements in computer capacity, that is changing a bit. It also tends to lend itself more for the wide field approach, which I showed at the beginning, because by definition, it's a faster approach to collect data. And much more recently, advances in semiconductor technology have meant that we've been able to produce devices which have more of an ability to do this. So really what we're trying to do is, is trying to get some speed and some accuracy from our data. So if we're looking at what other techniques there can be in addition to the TCSPC version, like I said, TCSPC is basically acknowledged as being a very important method with high sensitivity to collect fluorescence lifetimes. Other approaches include the frequency domain, here, rather than using a pulse light source, you'll modulate a continuous wave one. So we have our modulated light source. If we put in a fluorescent sample, what we will tend to find is that there is a change in the amplitude and also a phase shift. These can be plotted out, and it can be done for various different frequencies of modulation. If you then fit the data, you can get out the lifetime. Another technique is that of time gating. Time gating, you'll put in your pulse of light causing your decay. And then what we can do is sample the intensity at different times after the excitation. Obviously the accuracy of this will depend on the gate width. In other words, how many, in terms of time, how wide the gate is you're sampling and also the increments which you're taking over. Here, obviously, on this diagram was very short, was very large uh, increments. So each of these techniques has its own pluses and minuses. Like I said, TCSPC is generally acknowledged for its uh, sensitivity and its accuracy, especially when you're wanting to look at multi-exponential lifetimes. Although, if we're thinking about making array detectors, sometimes the technology is not so scalable for those. We also have the phase technique, which can be quite rapid for simple decays, but also requires a calibration process. It's not so good with multi-exponential decays, and also can require more intense samples than when you're getting out using TCSPC. The time gate approach, yes, you can make larger arrays, but you require very high frame rates in order to scan through the whole lifetime range, and it can be sensitive to any intensity fluctuations within that time. Generally speaking, TCSPC is sort of as being more like a gold standard for determination of lifetimes and multi-exponential. The other two techniques 
give a bit of course of life, can give a bit of course of lifetime determination because of the fewer points involved in the collection. So if we're concentrating more on the TCSPC cameras, in recent years, there have been a few advances. Some have been based on using intensifiers or microchannel plate devices with the sensitive anodes. So they can tell where the position of photon events are. And then this has been fed into a timing device to build out your lifetime image. Similarly, arrays built on SPAD detectors where the signals are taken out and then the timing done and then the lifetime imaging crews. And more interesting for us, what we're going to talk about in a moment, is the fact of incorporating the timing devices actually within the pixels themselves, which allows for a more parallel approach. In other words, rather than just the timing device being the uh, limitation, we can now just stream out the whole data from the complete array. So the technology which, may, which underpins this is the use of single photon avalanche diodes. These are basically diodes which can operate in a Geiger mode. So in other words, if, if you have a impinge, light impinging on the diode, you can get an avalanche, which you then quench off to burn off to amplify your signal. And recently, as well as having the detector part, technology has allowed the ability to actually make very small uh, timing devices, so you can actually fit them within the individual pixel. And this has been a great advancement in this field of uh, detection and timing for TCSPC. If we look at our pixel now, it contains a SPAD detector and some electronic circuitry. Normally, the SPAD, obviously, since we're, uh, occup since we're using part of the pixel for the electronic circuitry, does not collect a whole light falling on the pixel. It collects a fraction, which we know as a fill fact. So if we take our pixel with both our detector and our timing electronics in it, we can make out an array. And here is an example of a 192 by 126 uh, pixel array. And obviously this can then be packaged. And yet again, here we now have our pound coin again. And yet again, I'm afraid this thing costs a little bit more than a pound. But if you recall the previous picture with the TCSPC components, that was basically one set of timing electronics and one detector. And now what we have is over 24,000 detectors and timing electronics all built onto one chip, allowing a completely parallel approach to collecting the data. Parallel approach, yes. And also, I did mention that, yeah, maybe we're not getting all of the light collected into the detector because part of the pixel is actually used for uh, the electronics. There are some strategies to actually improve this. One is the use of micro lenses, which are fabricated onto the chip. And this will funnel in more light into the detector. And this will give it uh, an effective fill factor of about over 40%. And even more interesting for the future is to perhaps the ability to stack both the detector part on top of the timing electronics so that the detector occupies a larger area. In this 3D facts pixel, in fact, to actually access the SPAD detector, the light comes in through the digital circuitry. And this has the effect of actually reducing the wavelength range in the UV side, which we can detect. But yet again, using this technique, you can get a, over 40% fill factor. So there are strategies to improve the amount of light which you can actually collect in your image. And obviously there is a commercial device uh, available on this. I'm here from Hariba. So this is our camera based on a 192 by 126 SPAD TDC range. And basically this will detect light in the range of 400 to 900 nanometers and can be used for measuring fluorescence lifetimes from 200 to 20 picoseconds or so. 
I'm not going to go too much into this table. And just to say, you can use this for just doing normal measurements, so for collecting for certain periods of time, or you can use it in a more of a video mode where it's continuously running. And it's also possible to stream the actual raw photon video records to a file so you can post process. So the way that these things work is if we're taking our scanning technique, obviously we'll scan over a sample. Well, if we're doing a simultaneous acquisition, we can collect the whole sample at the same time. So theoretically, what you could say is, let's imagine we want to scan 20,000 pixels. Uh, I know this is a number that's a bit ridiculous, but let's say one second per pixel. So a scanning technique would take 20,000 seconds. For the simultaneous approach, which is parallel, we can do this in one second. And for us, we'll, deter, we'll call this presence lifetime acquisition by simultaneous histogramming, or flash for short. So theoretically, we know it can be a lot faster, but what's it like in practice? Well, here we're doing a scan, stage scan, trying to collect uh, over 228 million photons. And this took about 16 minutes. To do some, to collect a similar number of photons using the wide field and flash technique, we managed to collect this one in 15 seconds. So, you know, not quite the 20,000 times faster, which I was mentioning theoretically beforehand, but now here we get several orders of magnitude faster for the data. And this is now beginning to think, okay, can we actually now, since we got this ability to collect data very fast, can we actually make use of this to collect things real time? Well, there are certain criteria of how many photons you need to be able to fit exponential decay. This is just one of them taken from a paper some years back. So let's see how long it takes us to be able to collect, say, 200 photons, which we can say is then sufficient for fitting an exponential decay in each one. And in this particular data set on this system, we could collect it in 50 milliseconds. So if we think about a real time approach, this would give us potentially uh, 20 frames per second. So that's getting quite usable. Well, let's have a see what we can do with it. And places where we can actually put use of this is obviously like in the wide field approach to do imaging. And also, since we have a camera, this could also actually make it easy to add flim capabilities to systems such as turf systems and light sheets. So let's see. Here is just a sample of convolaria. This is being moved on the stage underneath the microscope. And here I'm showing a screen capture taken in real time with the intensity image on the left and the lifetime image on the right. And as we can see, we're actually taking here at 30 frames per second, which is about video rate. And we're getting both the lifetime contrast showing up. If you remember, the, one of the first slides I showed was convolaria with the structures inside the cells. Here we can see definitely a difference between lifetime contrast between those structures and the cells themselves. So it looks like that we can actually do here a good demonstration of the fact of looking at something, both the intensity image and the fluorescence lifetime image in real time. As well as looking real time, we could actually stream that out. And here's just an example of some beads. There's one marked in the top left hand corner, and that gradually moves down. And this is taken from data, which can be then streamed to a HDF5 file. And this allows post processing and more complex analysis to be occurred if you want to do more things than just to look at the average lifetime in real time. So this is also capable of being done. Another place where you're thinking, where could the uh, actually for instance, lifetime image real time to be useful? Well, there's a newish area of fluorescence guided surgery where fluorescence is used primarily to look at tumor boundaries to help surgeons when they're cutting out tumors. So 
But it's simply really been based on intensity image. But with the question is, could for instance lifetimes be useful in this case to actually look at the tumor boundary? Because we know there's advantages because it, it's not prone to photo bleaching effects. It's also independent of concentration. So let's have a look. And here we have an example on the model system. This makes use of pro the fluorescent properties of protoporphyrin 9. Protoporphyrin 9 is actually formed in the heme pathway within a cell. And there are some health agencies which use a pink drink based on the compound 5 aloe, which then becomes processed within the cell to form protoporphyrin. So in a model system, we make use of protoporphyrin. Obviously, we need to know where it emits and where it absorbs. And in our model, we make use of this in a substance called intralipid. And looking at the uh, intralipid protoporphyrin interaction, we find that there are actually two lifetimes prevalent in the, the protoporphyrin, one of a monomeric form and another, or it could either be photodegraded or dimeric. And this means that the average lifetime will depend on the wavelengths. And if you're using a filter, then basically we'll just summate all those ones together. And we know that we'll expect something around is short of 10 nanoseconds. So this is our fluorophore. And if we look at what some samples made up, just basically adding yeah, the fluorophore and interlipid into a gallon gum interlipid mixture to assimilate skin. We can then have a look at these under the microscope. And yet again, here we are moving the sample under the microscope. We have our intensity image on the left and our lifetime image on the right. So we can easily see fits underneath the sample of the sample as we're moving over it. So if we want to do a bit better analysis, we can see it real time as we did here, or we can pick out the frames and do a bit closer analysis. So we can have a look at say how the average lifetime over the whole frame or the intensity change happens. And what we're seeing here is both at the beginning and the end, where we're getting towards the edge of the our inclusion with our protoporphyrin, is that we're seeing more of a change or some more contrast actually in the lifetime data than we do if we're looking straightforwardly at the intensity data. So really, this is looking at, it could be a promising approach to make use of lifetime instead of just the normal intensity-based measurements for doing it. And obviously you need some technology which allows those lifetimes to be looked at in real time to be useful in this uh, field. Other areas where we can look at are more in sort of um, dynamic processes. One here is photosynthesis. Here's just some data taken from close to the guard cells, looking at some chloroplasts. And we can get it's multi-exponential. This is with a scanning system. And if we wanted to look at a dynamic process in one point, we can do, and we can then post analyze it and we can see changes in lifetimes, et cetera, with time. Using the wide field approach, you can actually use image several areas if you wanted to. Well, you, you can select several areas in your image and you can then monitor those with time and you can actually see that real time. So if you really wanted to have a look at photodynamic processes in photosynthesis, you can actually make use of that. Or that was in ivy, in some pond weeds, the chloroplasts are actually mobile. And I've just drawn up on top of here some where I think the cells are. And in this way, we can actually just look at motion within the actual cell. And here is mobile, mobile chloroplasts in pondweed. Cells are obvious places where we want to look at, which because if it's a live cell, they could be moving. And here in this example, we make use of looking at some yeast cells. There is a dye called FUN1 which is able to distinguish between uh, living and dead cells. Basically, in living cells, the dye is processed to form cylindrical intervacular structures, which change when they process it, it changes the, pro uh, the properties of the dye, and rather than emitting in the green, 
it emits more towards the red. So obviously, if you're looking at the picture, the green cells are dead, while those exhibiting red will be living. <clears throat> this is a wavelength approach, but we can actually change this to looking at it in lifetime. Here we're showing some decay associated spectra. I'm not gonna to go into too much detail, but if we're looking at these sort of more green end, the take on messages, life, average lifetime tends to be shorter for those in the green, where we're having the supposedly dead cells, while it's a bit longer in the red, where we're having the living cells. So what we can then do is look at this, again, real time, and we can see that we're having two yeast cells here. Intensity-wise, we can't see too much of a difference. But looking at the lifetimes, we can tell one's bluer and the other one's more green and red. So we can then make an uh, assumption about which one is living and which one is dead. So those are examples of living or moving cells or dynamic processes. We can also make use of the fact that this camera is a very easy way to add FLIM or fluorescence lifetime to other systems where you just normally take intensity. An example would be with a, digit, with a light scan, light sheet microscope system. And here we just have a quick example of a bit of mouse lung. We can then obviously get a lifetime out of it by swapping the intensity camera for, a life, for the lifetime one. And you can even take this a bit further. And here's a bit of work done in collaboration on the quantic project, where we're actually making use of changing some of the optics to be able to better fill the full detector array of the camera. Because if you're doing digital scan, maybe you just be um, collecting light in certain part of the array. Here we're trying to do a full array, and then we can actually uh, use of some data compression to actually flatten out the image so we can actually take in data at a lot faster rate. So yet again, if we're looking at some beads, we can do a distinction between the two the lifetime. And if we're doing our scanning using the light sheet, we can actually pick up a complete volume. And here is just some uh, picked cartoon for the data from three sorts of fluorescent beads, each with a different lifetime suspended in agar. And you can easily see that we have the three different lifetimes present there. So really today, what I want to say is that advances really in semiconductor technology, such as the basic on the complementary metal oxide semiconductor ones, are very promising for flim applications. The narrowing down of the lithography has meant that you'll be able to actually create both detectors and timing electronics in the individual pixels. And this is a parallel approach to collecting the data has allowed basically real-time imaging up to video rates to occur. Obviously, as well as looking at dynamic processes or mobile samples, this technique also allows the ability to add FLIM very simply onto other systems where you just normally look at intensity-based data without the need of scanning. Obviously, it's a wide field approach, so you're not gonna get quite the same uh, resolution as you would be expected if you're looking at a confocal technique, but here is very much a simplicity and ability to measure things very fast. And at that point in time, I'd actually like to thank you very much for your attention and I'll finish at this point. Thank you very much. That was so wonderful. Very good um, final thank you in many different languages. I, I wasn't quickly recognizing actually by looking at them. That was very nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think the uh, question and answers will be moderated. I think we have first, Nick, we have the Mentimeter. Um, yeah, which is, um, basically, on sorry? We can go ahead and share the screen on that. Yeah, please. There we go. So if you go to oh. the Mentimeter link in the chat, you will have the possibility to join.
so we give um, the, the speaker a quick break to kind of just recover and hopefully we have four participants we have to do with a few more but uh... <laughs> yeah come on yeah there we go I'm not sure what yeah, <laughs> good. Once in a lifetime that was quite talk. <laughs> This is the latest uh, developments in the detection of technology. Um, seven people, a couple more, and then we can launch. So this is all, all to win the, the amazing fold scope. It uh, will come winging its way to the lucky man winner in, um, once we've run the competition. All right, any more takers? No, okay, in that case, I will get on with it then. There we go. Yeah, it's the first talk after the summer, so I think it's a bit. Um... Oh, here we go. Right. Question number one. Enter. Oh. Right. Here we go. Answer fast to get your points. The fluorescence lifetime is the time for which percentage of excited molecules to decay? Is it 100%, 50%, or 37%? Hopefully, you've got your answer in already. <laughs> we just, okay, here we go. Let's see what the um, time's up. Oh, wow, three correct answers. What are those? I definitely saw that in the uh, early one in the presentation. Right. Let's see what the leaderboard has to put us on. Here we go. Shami and Dr. Centipede are the winner up front. Joanna is uh, hanging on there. Well, this is time, plenty of time for this all to change. Um, question two, coming up now. SPAD is an acronym for what? Is it single photon avalanche diode, single pixel analog device, or single pixel avalanche diode? A very good question, there. Hey, got a response there. Five people got that one. Hey, what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, five people got that right, but uh, <laughs> this is the go, kind of um, Mentimeter bug hitting you again. <laughs> the Mentimeter again. Well, so unfortunately, the leader will have changed. Damn it! All right. I didn't time. know that there was even an option to have uh, <laughs> this. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's okay. Working with all the kind of difficulties of life. I checked this presentation earlier. <laughs> the fluorescence lifetime is dependent on what? Is it the number of molecules, environmental interactions, or the measurement method? Let's see what, how this goes. Right. Hey, everyone got that one right. Okay, let's see who was fastest then. Let's see what the leaderboard says. <laughs> All right. Ah. Ooh, it's neck and neck now. Look. It's... I like the hustler. Yeah. Okay, Flipper, you're still there. The arrow is coming up right. <laughs> Next one. Fill factor is what? Mm. What is the fill factor? The number of pixels on a chip, how much light covers the chip, or the proportion of the chip cover, covered by SPAD? It's quite good to have some of the, well, the basic definitions. Yes, everyone's fun. listening to you, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. wonderful. Okay, let's see what, see, what the, uh, see what the leaderboard looks like now. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Ah, Flipper is you're maintaining your lead. Well done. Okay. It's probably Alessandro, hey? 
I'm not playing. I'm not playing. Question <laughs> five. Yes. <laughs> All right. Last question. I think you've done. I really hit the button fast. PPLX can be used to show tumor boundaries. It is injected into the tumor. It is metabolized from a precursor in the tumor cells, or it is injected into the blood and travels to the tumor where it is concentrated. And the correct answer is, it is metabolized. Right. Let's see who is the winner. Oh, Skids has got a fast answer. Let's see if that's enough. Oh, okay, Flipper, you're the winner. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourself to the uh, organizers, you can just or, um, say hello in the chat or um, send a message off offline. Isn't it like Flipper zones are best of fun? <laughs> right. Anyway, well done, Flipper. It's a, um, there you go. Laurent, well done. Okay, Alessandro, I'll hand over to you to do the questions. So thank you. And uh, well, first of all, thank you, Graham, for the, the, the presentation. Is uh, I'm actually very uh, I'm delighted by having more companies in, in, in the FLIM area that you know can push the commercialization of these technologies. Um so the prices uh, were cheaper with the con kind of competition, Alessandro. <laughs> yeah, although you need to test all of them, and uh, <laughs> um, sorry. So, if there is any other question, I see Valentin um, proposed the question. Uh, but if there is any other question, please let me know. Um, actually, um, the, the 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 questions from Valentin are I think overlapping really with what I wanted to ask. Um, um, so let let's. He was asking, or she? Sorry, I don't know. Um, more questions about more specifications about uh, general price range ranges and uh, various other parameters. Um, let, let, let's start perhaps in terms of uh, price range. Of course, this is not uh, advertisement, but uh, just to give <laughs> us a feeling about uh, budgeting, about this or other alternative technologies related to flame. Yeah, well, in terms of pricing, I'm probably not the best person to ask about this, but the technologies is basically, we're probably talking about several tens of thousands of pounds for these things. Yeah. Obviously, it depends on a few things, but basically, roughly in that order of magnitude. Okay. You're not going to get it for the pound coin, which I showed on some of the slides, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, about other things. I mean, is uh, generally speaking, is difficult to go below, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand pounds without without excitation sources. Let's say yeah. uh, in in wide field systems, and then of course, depending on which excitation source you have, it can yeah. go. Yeah, because obviously, anywhere. if you're doing TCSPC, what you will need to have is a pulse laser source. Exactly. So there has to also be a synchronization going into your camera. Which, so you have to have a pulse source which puts out like a TTL signal, for example, which you can then use for synchronization. Yeah. But so that's, that's the major thing you'll need because on the camera, for example, you also have the detector and the timing electronics. So there's no separate box for it. It's just the camera plus that. Yes, 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 yes. So something, uh, again, I'm monitoring the question and uh, putting, trying to make a synthesis of them. Um, so you mentioned about the, 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 the fill factor. You also mentioned, you know, the, 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 the 3D stacking of uh, chips, uh, which I'm looking forward for it, but eventually I see that uh, the advantage, or to say in terms of, from compared to fill factor, eventually would be minimal. But I wonder if uh, there will be an advantage in terms of uh, quantum efficiency. For example, if you can have uh, back thinned <laughs> uh, spada rays. Yeah, no, I, obviously this is a field which there is continuous development in. If you just look at the number of papers, you can see that things are progressing. So obviously if you're using the 3D stacking, you can probably get things a bit, uh, a bit larger on the fill factor. Okay, you can get maybe a bit better on the quantum efficiencies into more into the red end of things. Uh, microlensing is obviously 
uh, simple a way to do things in some respects because you just take the chip which you have and then part of the fabrication you you put on top of the lenses. So as long as you get everything nicely matched, yes, yes. then so you'll increase that. Is so, in your camera the micro lens already integrated already or or, or isn't or is optional? Um, <clears throat> No, there are there are there is an existence of microwave lens arrays as well. So yes, okay. So it's which, too. which is the effective uh, um, uh, quantum efficiency? I mean, if you consider also the probability of detection of the <laughs> silicon substrate. Yeah, yeah. It, the substrate itself, you're probably be talking about on the detector about a thirty-five percent quantum efficiency. So basically, it will then a mixture of that quantum efficiency plus the fill factor, which will give you your real overall sensitivity of the device. So these things are still uh, greater than what you'd expect, say, for maybe a standard photomultiplier. A standard photomultiplier will probably be between 10 and 20% quantum efficiency. If you're taking a hybrid detector, then that'll be a bit more. That would be more like about a forty percent efficiency, or can be. Yeah, no, exactly. So I mean, I guess that uh, I mean, uh, just to misunderstand me, I mm. I, I, I love this technology. Yeah. So is uh, I'm absolutely <laughs> supportive. Yes, um, yeah. but uh, with an hybrid detector, a gasp photocathode, uh, you you know, in a scanning microscope, you get forty percent and no other losses. I mean, beside a little bit yeah. of a mirror here and there. Yeah, no, if you agree in that case. If you're talking with normal sort of intensity based ones, yes, yeah. you don't you don't get quite the efficiency of that. But then again, you get no, basically also, single photon uh, sensitivity from your camera. Yeah, but also, and I'm speaking about um, yeah. uh, confocal with uh, for TCSPC. Um, yeah. So, a question from uh, uh, Nick. Um, so which are the photon rates that you can measure, uh, which is related to which is the dead time of this part? Basically, this is determined by the readout, ray, uh, readout rate of the array of the, uh, the pixels. So basically, there's a readout every 80 microseconds. So really, each of the pixels can only take in one, one photon per pixel per frame and you'll be reading out at about 12 and a half kilohertz each frame, the frames. These are the frames, but the, 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 the ah, so you mean that, which is the, ten, the dead time of the SPAD? So it, it really is overcome by the readout rate of the, the frame, because each pixel can only take in one photon per frame. So okay. it will stay there until you read it out. So the read, so it's really now in this case determined by the readout rate, which is twelve and a half thousand times per second. So equivalent, okay. you could say to about eighty microseconds. Yes. Okay. So you have a, a twelve kilohertz maximum speed multiplied by the number of pixels. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Got it. Um, Stan is asking. Uh, he's saying although the camera is fast, um, particularly real time, the resolution is significantly poorer than slower confocal methods. Why is that? How is there any improvement? Well, basically, you are limited to the pixel array, which should be a bit narrow. You can obviously play around a bit more. What you're seeing today is basically more raw data on it. And a lot will also depend on the optical system which you're putting it onto. So we are limited to, in this case, a 192 by 126 pixel array. And each of those pixels is roughly about 18 by 9 microns in size. So it depends how you want to fill that up in your field of view. You can obviously uh, look at a very small field of view, so you're getting higher resolution on the thing, or you can look at a larger field of view, in which case you're losing out a bit on the, the resolution. You'll never get quite the same resolution, obviously, as you will using a confocal technique. And we do have to remember it is also wide field. So you do get a bit of the out of focus coming in as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, so I guess that from the point of view of uh, other technologies, of uh, course, scanning microscope that can be slower, but uh, more flexible from this point of view. And other wide field technologies have more pixels, but 
they are not have the advantage of the CSPC. Yes, yeah, so if you basically choose the same the the technology for the process you want to look at. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So keys, uh, I see in the lifetime range of the camera is 200 picoseconds to 20 nanoseconds. Does this cover most of the fluorescent dyes molecules used? This one is basically will cover most of the organic dyes. If you're talking about standard protein labels, for example, they're normally between one and a half to about six nanoseconds. So it covers that. Yeah, there's some longer lived dyes like triangulonians, they're about six to 20 nanoseconds they will fit in as well and the 20 nanosecond is really the longest if you want to see a complete decay if you want to uh, leave it partially decayed you can obviously use a longer lived uh, lifetime but generally speaking the range from 200 to 20 will cover most of the normal label yeah um, Miruna is asking, uh, can you please briefly describe the calibration steps required for film measurements? Um, I, I think is referring particularly to phasor analyses that are, you know, phase-like. Okay, because <laughs> basically the camera is already calibrated for the normal TCSPC, so you just really put it on and do it. There will be a distance calibration which you required in the software, so you know for the scale bar, and that's about it. For the phaser calibration that's only really measuring a sample with a known single lifetime so in other words to get the phaser to work i would normally just measure using the camera uh, a colored slide for example with a known lifetime measure that one and then you just press there's a calibration procedure you just press calibrate and that will calibrate the phaser part it's equivalent to maybe using like an irf in normal TCSPC, you do a lifetime calibration. As long as none of the conditions stay, it will work, but I'd recommend we're probably doing that every time you're turning on. Yeah. So Valentin is asking, uh, um, is the camera, uh, if the camera is only taking up to one photon per readout, how are you generating grayscale intensity images? Is, is it frame averaging? I suppose it's summing. Uh, yeah, you basically will be sub we have some, in some frames together. Because obviously you're reading out twelve and a half thousand times per second. Obviously, TCSPC itself is more like low light levels, so you don't expect to get too many photons. So you will end up basically combining lots of frames together to get your data. And uh, yes, uh, are you doing these computation on FPGA on board or on software? A lot of this of the computation, which is the displays which you've done today, are done on the computer. On the computer, okay. Yeah. So we will be streaming the data out of the camera and then processing on the computer. So a large bit will depend a little on whether you have a faster computer, obviously, with more processing power. That can that help speed things up. Yeah. Okay, so may, may I ask, uh, um, in terms of the, the chip dimension, which is uh, probably, you know, one aspect that can put off uh, some of the potential users, uh, I say this then I'm also acknowledging that very often when we do film images, we might do it 256 by 256 uh, <laughs> uh, pixel anyway, yes. Um, but uh, um, do you have any plan uh, or which is the potential timeline for plan to roll out uh, larger chips? Yeah. Well, at this present moment in time, we're concentrating really on the ones which we are using there. But obviously, this is a field which is basically ex reasonably expanding fast. So there's always uh, technologies of coming up to increase the ways of putting uh, pixels together to increase the number of pixels. So it's a field which is not staying still and yep. is advancing. Okay, excellent. Well, it was a nice chat. If there is there, is there anyone else, any last questions? Also, the other organizers want to mention anything or? No, I think it was a very good overview. And also, I mean, I noticed nice. the other company um, colleagues actually in the audience. So, I mean, if they wish to give a talk in the same way, I think it was an excellent example how to present without, you know, having a commercial 
sales show, but actually giving very good insights and making right. people aware of technology and making them yeah, interested in technology and showing the advances. And that was really excellent. So thank you. Absolutely. So, so other uh, suggestions, if you want to send us an email, we also happy for other people to come forward. But but let's thank the Graham for today. For okay, thank excellent you. Talk. Thank you. Okay, so welcome back everyone uh, from <laughs> holidays, and thank you, Graham, uh, for you know start kicking off this new season. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Graham. Hello. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. Bye.